From the spooky land near Salem, Mass, to you listening around the world, this, my ghouls and guys, is Spaced Out Saturday. I'm your weekend host, Lynn Wallington. How are you all tonight? You know, on Spaced Out Saturday, we like to sit back, share a drink, and have a chat with friends. So get comfy, join me on the couch for what's sure to be some great conversation tonight. We welcome you to tonight's show on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. If you want to take a listen to the archives, they are free at youtube.com slash spacedoutradio. Just do us the favor and hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. I can get it tonight. And my personal handle, Witchy Linny, Witchy with a Y, Linny with an I-E. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show and Witchy Linny. And if you haven't had a chance to check it out, our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a ton of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading out on the SOR Newswire. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. You know, since it's Spaced Out Saturday, that means, as you know, it's cocktail time for me. And for tonight's drink, I am enjoying a delicious, a pineapple jalapeno margarita. It's amazing. And if you're having a drink, either alcoholic or not, share with the group. Tell us, what are you having tonight? And just a reminder that we have our after hour show tonight, just after this show. And as always, Dave Scott will be manning the captain's chair Monday through Friday. And tonight, you guys, I'm so excited. We have Kathleen Martin joining us. Kathleen is a researcher, author, conference presenter, experiencer, advocate, hypnosis practitioner, and support group facilitator. She's given on-camera commentary on numerous television shows and movies. She's known as one of the leading UFO contact researchers of our time. That is so true. This woman, if you've never heard her talk before, one, you're living under a rock because obviously you have to have heard Kathleen before, but she has so much knowledge, it's incredible. Uh, since 1990, she has researched the perplexing nature of UFOs and the non-human entities associated with highly advanced aerial vehicles via her own groundbreaking research, investigation, and experimentation. Her research has extended to archival collections and the U.S. government's involvement in the investigation of UFOs and its major studies. This has combined to give her a depth of knowledge that few possess. Very true. She is the 2013 recipient of MUFON's Researcher of the Year Award and the 2021 recipient of the International UFO Congress Lifetime Achievement Award. She earned a BA degree in social work and was employed as an educator and education services coordinator while attending graduate school. She's a certified practitioner of regression hypnosis and the quantum healing hypnosis technique technique. Additionally, she offers the Awakening Soul support group for experiencers who feel an intense calling to be a part of the answer and to assist others who are beginning to awaken their relationship with non-human interactions. Her interest in UFOs and contact began in 1961 when her aunt and uncle, you may have heard of them, Betty and Barney Hill, had a close encounter and subsequent abduction in New Hampshire's White Mountains. She spent 15 years in painstaking investigation of the Hill abduction case and continues to seek the scientific analysis of the compelling evidence. She has worked on three comprehensive studies on nearly 5,000 experiencers. Her bestseller with nuclear physicist Stanton T. Friedman is Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. She and Stanton worked together for nearly 14 years and collaborated on two additional books, Science Was Wrong and Fact Fiction and Flying Saucers. Her book with Denise Stoner, The Alien Abduction Files, includes her investigation of six intergenerational cases of abduction and contact. Uh, her fifth book, Extraterrestrial Contact, What to Do When You've Been Abducted, is a comprehensive guide to contact for experiencers, those who love them, professionals who work with experiencers, and the interested public. Her books are available in all formats on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, and autographed copies can be purchased on her website at www.kathleen.com hyphenmartin.com. And we have that down in the description below for you guys. And just a couple reminders before we start. If you have a question, please type it in all caps so that I can see it easier. And the Super Chat is open. As always, the Super Chat is a great way to support SOR on a nightly basis. For those of you who are new to our channel, this is a live show. So we'll be taking a five minute break after the first hour and welcome. We're happy to have you here if you're new. And for our loyal Spaced Out family, welcome back. I always love to have you here. Also, if you know anyone who enjoys a good chat with friends, go ahead and share the show with them right now so they can join in on the fun and learn all about UFOs and experiencers, as well as the science and Betty and Barney Hill and all the fun stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Also, if you haven't done it yet, please subscribe if you like UFO or paranormal stories. And while you're there, please hit that like button for us. All right, everyone, let's get Kathleen onto the show. Hi, Kathleen. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks. Great to be with you. 
so nice to have you here. So I know everybody is very excited to hear from you tonight. Um, so you you have so much. <laughs> it's hard to know where to start. There's so much. I've got a lot of years to do it. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. I love it. So why don't we go ahead and start with Betty and Barney Hill. Mm -hmm. um, I know some of some people out there may have heard you talk about her, but let's talk about, or them, I'm, excuse me. Um, how did you get started in learning about what happened with Betty? They were your aunt and uncle, correct? They were. I was 13 when it happened and I arrived home from school uh, in the afternoon and my mother was on the phone with Betty and she was telling my mother about the flying saucer that she and Barney had seen the previous evening that had come so close to their car that they were afraid they might have been contaminated. So my mother uh, called a neighbor of ours who was a physicist to find out what Betty and Barney should do uh, to protect themselves, to test themselves. And for some reason, he said, uh, if you have a compass, take it out to the car and see how the needle reacts. Because we know the needle is going to react when you put it up by the battery, but yeah. certainly not at the trunk of the car where uh, they found shiny spots that hadn't been there the day before. They were all the same size. And when they put the compass over the spots, the needle uh, rotated. And uh, that's an indication of a magnetic field. So it uh, doesn't just happen on an old metal car. I've tried it. I'm an yeah. experimenter too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's fascinating. So that's interesting. So, um, so it was your mom, you said, who encouraged them to talk to this physicist? No, my mother called the physicist. Oh, the, your mother did. Okay. Knew my mother, you know, he was a neighbor of ours. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a handy neighbor to have, especially when something like this happens. Have. And, you know, he knew far more than we knew about mm -hmm. this because he knew about an electromagnetic field. My mother for somehow, for some reason, thought that it was uh, to measure radiation. Okay. Um, but no, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do that. Yeah. It's so then, an indicator of a magnetic field. Yeah. So now at this point, Betty thought it was just, they just had seen the UFO. She didn't well, really they had, anything happen more. They had other perplexing uh, evidence when they arrived home. Mm -hmm. They were later than they anticipated. Um, they figured out later on that it was a uh, full two hours later wow. than they were supposed to arrive home. And they, uh, her dress was torn in several places. Oh, wow. And um, my uncle's best dress shoes were so deeply scraped that he had to buy new shoes. Hmm. Their wa the watchers that they had been wearing that night were running fine uh, when they checked them at 10 o'clock. Wow. And, but by the time they arrived home, they had stopped working. Betty reset her watch and uh, didn't didn't run. I, I say she reset it because it tells what time she did this. It was 515 in the morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, no, the watches never ran again. The binocular strap was broken. Leather strap severed. Uh, all these mysteries some of that they did Betty couldn't figure out how her dress was torn. Barney couldn't figure out how his the tops of his shoes were so deeply scraped. That was that was the thing that was most troubling, I think, was the evidence. It was something that you just can't write off. Right. Yeah, I could understand that and and not knowing what had happened and finding your dress torn and your shoes all kind of scuffed up. Obviously that would make you think was there some sort of a um you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I keep the kerfuffle is coming to mind. So we'll use that. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. So, okay. So then, um, so then they talked to the physicist, the, the compass went a little wonky. So what happened next? Um, then 
<laughs> at my house. Mm -hmm. Here I am 13 years old and it's dinner time and my father's best friend comes for his nightly cup of coffee with the family on his way home from work. And he is the former chief of police of Newton, New Hampshire. Hi. And so he says to uh, my mother, well, tell Betty that she needs to call Pease Air Force Base and report that sighting because Project Blue Book wants th those reports. And oh, so wow. my mother's back on the phone with Betty and uh, telling her this. So she and Barney the next day made the report. Mm -hmm. And within two days, my, fam my parents, my two brothers and I, drove down to Betty's and Barney's house. They lived about 20 miles away from my childhood home okay. and uh, got to see the evidence for myself, got wow. to uh, hear the story with my own ears. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. So I found it really fascinating. And, yeah. you know, I loved Nancy Drew. Those Me too. <laughs> books. Yep. Gosh, I don't know why I didn't become a detective, but <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way you did. <laughs> in a way, I guess I did. Yes, but you know, it, it there was a mystery that needed to be solved, and uh, I've worked for years <laughs> solving that mystery. Amazing. So, when you first kind of heard about this, and they were starting to maybe piece together that something more had happened. Um, mm -hmm. were intrigued. Was, was there any fear in anyone at that point in time? Or was it just kind of more intrigue as to what really happened? Well, for Barney, I think there was fear. Uh, he, he told Betty, don't tell anyone. Yeah. No good can come of this. Mm -hmm. And of course, Betty was like me, very, very curious. She went to the Portsmouth Public Library, took out the first book she'd ever read on the topic. She mm. wanted to learn all she could. Yeah. And, and that was distressing to Barney because he just wanted to forget about it, to just let it go. Because Barney was the one who saw the non-humans and he had conscious recall oh, for wow. this. Betty was sitting in the car uh, watching for cars coming, the car had to be parked in the middle of the road because the craft was hovering just off the side of the road and mm -hmm. Barney didn't want to drive underneath it. Smart. So he stopped the car, um, got out with the binoculars. Betty stayed in the car. Uh, he had the door open, the car running. She couldn't see what he was doing, but the craft shifted to an adjacent field and descended to within about 100 feet from him, he estimated. Wow. And that's when uh, he held the binoculars up to his eyes and saw those uh, entities dressed in black, shiny uniforms that he said were somehow not human and uh, frightened him greatly because something started to drop down out of that bottom of the craft and little red lights on fins uh, started to slide out and he, became immediately terrified that he was going to be captured. That's wow. that's why I titled the book Captured, <laughs> because ah. he, he said that. And so, yeah, so Barney uh, ran to the car, screaming to Betty they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. And as when he got into the car, mm -hmm. uh, he saw the craft was now coming in his direction. Mm -hmm. And within... A short period of time, they heard code like buzzing sounds on the trunk of the car where they found those spots. Mm -hmm. And uh, the car vibrated. They had that electrical tingling sensation through their bodies that is so familiar to experiencers mm -hmm. and uh, lost track of everything. They, they found themselves, they later found out two hours later. Um, on another section of the highway, 35 miles down the road from where they had previously been. Mm -hmm. And they had memories of being finding themselves on a dirt road. They were no longer on the highway. Mm -hmm. They remembered encountering a roadblock and uh, observing a big fiery orb that appeared to be sitting on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and they went back time and time again to try to find 
that road because they thought if they could only find that road and where they saw that roadblock and the fiery orb, it would jog their memories and they'd remember what happened. But they ended up, um, Barney was referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon because this began to bother him so terribly that he developed a bleeding ulcer oh, wow. and uh, high blood pressure and he was hospitalized. And, uh, you know, that was life threatening. So uh, they had to do something. Uh, traditional medical treatment was not um, taking care of his problem. And so he was referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon, who uh, was a specialist at treating uh, patients with uh, who were suffering from trauma. Mm -hmm. And that trauma had induced this physiological response. Yeah. And Betty Bar went with Barney, and and uh, they he saw them for separate hypnosis sessions, hmm. and he reinstated hip, uh, amnesia hmm. at the end of each session, and uh, fascinating, fascinating hmm. information came out that uh, you know they actually were taken. Of course, they had that evidence. They should have known. That <laughs> <laughs> well, back then, I mean, <laughs> we were the first big case everybody heard about. So yes, and you know? You know, they, they didn't want anyone to. Well, they I can't say anyone. They told their friends, the Air Force, mil military people they were friendly with, the family. But yeah. we were all sworn to secrecy. Mm. Uh, some people. I'm not very good at keeping secrets. So mm -hmm. um, the word spread yeah. over time and uh, they were outed in a mm -hmm. newspaper, the mm -hmm. Boston Traveler for five days, articles about them. I just read over all of those articles again. I have those uh, copies of those newspapers. Oh, and wow. uh, John Luttrell really did a very good job of, uh, investigating that he found witnesses to the craft that night and uh, had talked to the Air Force had talked to uh, the National Investigations Committee on aerial phenomena who also investigated this oh, wow. and uh, it was he did a good job writing those articles I must say even though we, he mm -hmm. Betty and Barney were extraordinarily distressed by this yeah and at that time they uh, had uh, political activities going on in the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, Barney uh, had been appointed to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights State Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a delegate to Lyndon Johnson's inauguration. Mm -hmm. In fact, the three of us were invited guests by Lyndon Johnson. Wow, and, that's amazing. Uh, yes, yeah, it was wonderful. And uh, he was, Barney also headed up a literacy program. Uh, because in, in those days, you had to pass a literacy test in order mm -hmm. to vote. So he received an award from, for doing that. Right. And then he uh, also used funding from the Office of Economic Opportunity to set up the Rockingham County Community Action Program. Mm -hmm. He was on a team of people, but he was the team leader. So That's he amazing. was the one who received the recognition. Wow. Barney sounds like an amazing guy. He was amazing. And, you know, he's, his IQ was 140. He wow. was a wonderful speaker, had a great uh, magnetic personality. Mm -hmm. He was just a terrific, kind person. Sounds and like. And Betty was, too. Um, she was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. Oh, nice. Yes. That's fantastic. So you followed in her footsteps in that as well. Well, I started <laughs> out that way. You know, I was going to be a writer. Mm -hmm. That's what I was studying in college and and Betty said to me, Kathy, do something practical. You'll never make a living as a writer. I love social work. You'll, you, you'll love it too. You'll work all your life. You'll get a pension. You'll get benefits. All the things that you won't get as a writer. So yeah. I tried it and didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> I was... Uh, I, I tried psychiatric social work. I ended mm -hmm. up in, in the field of education. Yeah. Um, and as an educator, an education services coordinator, before I decided I wanted really to be a writer. Oh, good. <laughs> good for you. Yeah. 
a good advice by Betty as well. Good advice. Uh-huh. Got to be practical. Yeah. I yeah, love it. Practical advice. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, and also in your work with experiencers, I'm sure that that social work degree comes in handy. I, oh, I know like for myself as well, my degrees in psychology. And as you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, a trauma, as you were talking about, involved right. a lot of the time. Even the people that um, maybe it doesn't sound as traumatic, they still struggle with that uh, understanding. And so there's definitely that a, a, that component that is very necessary. Well, absolutely. And um, I've worked with people who had highly positive experiences mm-hmm. with the human types yeah. uh, and, of entities, and uh, but were terribly traumatized because they couldn't remember what happened mm-hmm. and just assumed they'd been abducted and taken to a table and experimented on. Yeah. You know, they found out, no, it wasn't, that's not what happened. Mm-hmm. But it, I mean, it still can induce trauma. Absolutely. I think that's one of the toughest things that I found that, that people struggle with is that not knowing and learning how to kind of sit within that space of not knowing because it's difficult. It's absolutely like one of the most difficult aspects of this whole phenomenon. Yes. And it, and it's fearful. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Because you don't know what happened. It could right. have been something bad. It could have been something mm-hmm. good. You don't know. And if you, and a lot of people remember the the beginning of it mm-hmm. and uh, the having the fight or flight response yeah. and, um, being you know being taken to craft where they generally feel comfortable when they arrive there um, but yeah it's difficult for people yeah so okay so something you said i was interesting to me so you said barney had conscious recall but then at the end of these hypnosis hypnosis sessions that um, they were get they, the amnesia was returned to them, I guess. Um, so did he have only a certain amount of conscious recall and did they ever end up kind of finding out what came out in these sessions? So what Betty and Barney both had conscious recall for was everything up until the time that they heard those buzzing sounds on the car. Barney had the conscious recall of observing those mm-hmm. non-human entities looking down at him from the craft that was only about a hundred feet above him. Yeah. And you know, the terror that went along with that. And uh, so that's what he had the conscious recall for. And that I said, you know, vague memories of that dirt road. Mm-hmm. They remembered that of the roadblock of the fiery orb. Mm -hmm. And then the memory returned when they were 35 miles down the highway from where they had been previously um, before the beeping sounds, the buzzing Mm -hmm. sounds. And uh, Betty said to to Barney, um, well, they, they had a second series of these buzzing sounds. And Betty said to Barney, well, now do you believe in flying saucers? <laughs> and Barney said, oh, Betty, don't be ridiculous. I can make that sound. So he stopped the car. He drove it from side to side, and he could not reproduce that sound. That's amazing. <laughs> he and so Betty were always bantering back and forth. They, they That's have amazing. Been doing that. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. My grandparents were the same way. It was amazing. <laughs> It was always so much fun to be around them. So Betty was a believer then in flying saucers before this happened. Well, my mother had had a fairly close encounter in 1958. And so Betty wasn't really sure, but Mm -hmm. she couldn't think of any other explanation for this like large mothership hanging over uh, a field as she and another aunt were going, uh, coming home from grocery shopping on a Friday night, they stopped the car uh, at a a house and the people who live there went out and they saw it too. They saw little uh, like flying saucers or um, disc, disc shaped objects flying around that larger one and entering the craft. Amazing. Wow. So I'm, so have you ever had an experience, Kathleen? Because as you know, a lot of times this happens within families. Um, have you ever seen a UFO yourself or had anything like that happen? Yes, I have. Yeah. In fact, um, 
I don't know when it began for me, mm-hmm. but I do know that when I was 17 years old, I, uh, Betty was working uh, with a team of scientists doing an experiment to see if she could call in a craft to land uh, on my grandparents' farm. Oh, wow. And she would go out and every night at nine o'clock, she would send these messages, land on the Barrett's farm in Kingston. <laughs> so uh, I grew up across the street and one did come in. It landed 200 feet from my childhood home. It was observed by two people. Uh-huh. And uh, my mother and I remembered being on that craft. Wow. I remembered being on a table. It was really terrifying. It just yeah. it caused so much pain and, mm. and suffering for many, many years. But I didn't dare to talk about it because of what happened to Betty and Barney, how, how they were ridiculed. Yeah. Wow. Um, so did you, uh, now you, you do regressions yourself on people. How, did you ever, were you ever curious about, you know, your experience or were you just kind of good with what you, what you did remember? Um, I, I was taken repeatedly after that throughout my lifetime. So uh, finally, I, you know, a Bud Hopkins hypnotized me. I spoke oh, with John wow. Mack. Amazing. Dr. John Mack. I, um, I spoke with other people in the field who I trusted to maintain confidentiality. Mm-hmm. Dr. Jim James Harder from the University of California um, was uh, the chief investigator of abductions for the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. Mm-hmm. During the 1970s, uh, he investigated this and hypnotized me and my mother, but we were never going to make this public. I thought yeah. I would go to my death and just leave a written account yeah. uh, for history. But uh, over time, uh, it became more acceptable. Mm-hmm. And people kept asking me to, to please tell people, instead of lying, say, yes, I am an experience. Yeah. <laughs> I always going to say, oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, it's understandable. And, yeah. And so I, I did for the benefit of others who have had mm-hmm. these experiences. And after I finally worked through all of this, uh, Denise Stoner helped me more than anyone through hypnosis and her support group. Yeah. She's amazing. I, I started to work on myself to develop methods uh, to overcome fear mm-hmm. to, uh, through self-hypnosis, through the, uh, to end that fight or flight response and to project love. Mm-hmm. And when I did that, the experience became much better, much yeah. nicer, and then they started to give me information. Oh, nice. So I was really pleased with that, that uh, there was an enormous change. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, okay, so Mike has a question, which I'm going to get back to, but I'm going to ask Kim's really quick, just because this pertains to what you're talking about. How much is conscious memories for Kathleen? So I think, yeah, how much do you remember consciously versus what you had to get kind of uh, through hypnosis? I, uh, oh, probably 60% was mm-hmm. conscious memory and probably 40% through hypnosis. Wow, that's amazing. That's a lot. Yeah, I remembered quite a lot, but Jim Harder uh, gave me a post-hypnotic suggestion mm-hmm. that I would be able to overcome any blocks that were put there and, and have conscious recall. And that's sort of probably what made me so frightened is to have yeah. that conscious recall. <laughs> yes, understandable. Um, <laughs> I, I was living in the mountains in Colorado, and I had uh, two experiences where I was missing, and people uh, were looking for me. Oh wow! Um, the craft was seen both times. Hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I do want to get back to that, but let, let me ask Mike's question because I've kind of left him hanging here. Um, and I'm assuming he's talking about um, the experiment that Betty did in calling down the craft. Was any of that experiment documented? 
Uh, yes, in fact, it was because the scientists were scripting Betty. And mm -hmm. so uh, they were tracking this. They would give specific instructions, longitude, latitude, um, so many days into the year, yeah. uh, that sort of thing, time frame. And uh, then they would go out and look for craft that Betty was sending to them. And uh, sometimes it did work and they documented it. And um, there was one time where they used the word moccasin. And mm -hmm. so uh, she was supposed to send this craft to moccasin and it did show up. But there was an experiment someplace else where the word moccasin was also used. So they didn't they couldn't say that the craft that showed up was more than just a coincidence. Oh wow. <laughs> that oh, that's a time. <laughs> oh no. That's amazing yeah. though. So now what did these crafts look like? Were they like physical crafts or was it more of a like a, a light like you hear about sometimes? The ones that the scientists saw? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, they, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really sure to tell you the truth. I just wow. don't know what, I don't remember. Yeah. I, mean, I, have, their, I have their reports here, yeah. but it's probably been, oh, 18 years since. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh my goodness. Now what about, you said you saw one, one time with your mom though, that Betty had called down. Do you remember what that one looked like? Um, I was on one. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't re I remember what the inside looked like. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> the room, yeah. or the table and these entities uh, standing down by my feet. And I think there were others, a couple, maybe one or two on the side. Mm -hmm. And I thought that they were um, doing some kind of operation on mm -hmm. In fact, the way I interpreted it at first, before I put all of that information together, was that I needed an operation. But I was so afraid of doctors that my mother arranged for them to come into the house at night and do the sur surgery on me. Wow. Um, yeah, that's that's the way my 17-year-old mind rationalized. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Now, the entities that, that Betty and Barney saw, do you remember seeing the ones that you had an experience with? And were they the same types of entities? They were the same entities, I think. Oh, wow. I described their behavior to mm -hmm. Betty. And uh, I believe it was the same group. Now, refresh my memory. I know I've, I've heard before, but I can't off the top of my head remember. Were they human-like entities or were they more gray-like that you all had the experiences with? There were with? two groups of, of grays okay. there. The the smaller ones who are you know, just the assistants and uh, can go and procure people um, and take them to the craft, that sort of thing. And then there were the taller ones who were the communicators, the... Mm -hmm. Uh, physicians, that yeah. sort of thing. It's so interesting. We hear that so often with experiencers. And I love that when the, the information kind of um, collaborates together and you, you hear, because I mean, really, you could experience anything, I suppose, with these. But usually when those two groups are together, it's kind of the, the smaller ones are like the little worker bees. And then the larger mm -hmm. ones seem to be the ones in, in charge of things. And yes. organizing. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, Donna has a question for you. Did the UFO entities tell Barney and Betty they were coming back and what they and what did they want? Well, um, Betty actually invited the one that she called the leader that I know is the escort. You see that one over and over again, they, that you're comfortable with that individual. Yeah. And Betty, uh, as they as he was escorting her back to the car, um, He's, he said to her, I know that you were very frightened and uh, uh, something like apologizing. This was not spoken. It was telepathic communication. So she was interpreting what he was saying. And, uh, and she said, uh, well, you know, I'm just a normal person, but 
there are other people who know a lot more about this field than I do. And do you think you could come back and meet them? I could set up a meeting for you. And he said uh, to her, well, I don't know if I can. Uh, there's a possibility that I can come back. And Betty said to him, well, how would you find me? Out of all the people on this earth, how would you find me? And he said, we can always find those that we want to find. Well, that's an intriguing response. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. We have okay. We have a couple more questions. They have a lot of questions for you tonight, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask some of these instead of holding them all off because um, I know there'll be a lot more. Um, so Paul and Cyan want to know: Have you ever met anyone on the craft that you you knew or met afterwards? So I'm, I'm assuming they mean like other humans. Yes. Yeah, I I have, and. I was taken one time when I lived in the mountains in Colorado, mm -hmm. and uh, I was there was a, a round room with kind of a domed top, mm -hmm. and there were several people in there um, from Crested Butte that I knew, and I believe that Denise Stoner, with whom I've written a book, who <laughs> hypnotized me, who. Uh, we've worked together for a number of years now, was on that craft too. She lived only 20 miles away from me, but we didn't know each other. Oh, wow. Yeah. But uh, I believe that she was was on that craft as well. That's amazing. And, it's a, and it, it brought you two together at some point. I'm assuming you must have met in, did you both realize it like when you first met? Well, we met in Florida. I had moved from New Hampshire to Florida, and I went to one of her meetings. She was the chief investigator for Florida MUFON at the time and um, the state section director. She was uh, holding, I guess it was monthly meetings, mm -hmm. and I found out about that, and I went to one of her meetings, and that's when we met, and she recognized me oh, wow. and, uh, and asked me to her home. Uh, for lunch one day. And that's when she told me that she was an experiencer. Amazing. And um, she didn't know, I don't think at that time that I was, maybe she did. I, I you know that was quite a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But so I asked her, after she told me what happened, if I could investigate her case. Oh, and, nice. <laughs> and, you know, so I did. Uh, mm -hmm. She's a lifelong experiencer. Yeah. and generational, intergenerational, mm -hmm. like myself. And uh, so I, I did quite an extensive investigation. I did the hypnosis sessions with Denise and her husband, oh, wow. uh, separately reinstating amnesia, just like Dr. Simon did with mm -hmm. Betty and Barney. Of course, they they could remember at the end. I gave mm -hmm. them the transcripts and the, the tapes, just yeah. like Betty and Barney had the tapes and that, that I, I have them now. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, so, so I did that. And then mm -hmm. we ended up writing uh, the alien abduction files uh, together. So Denise's story is in there. And then another uh, extraordinary intergenerational case uh, that I uh, worked on in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. all independent research that I do. Uh, yeah. I find it's best to work independently because I can maintain confidentiality. I don't have to worry that someone might get a hold of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, it generally lasts for years on end because it happens time and time again. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So I think I've been taken probably twice with Denise. Oh, wow. It's amazing. Denise actually helped validate one of my first experiences too, which is uh -huh. funny. Yeah. And it wasn't one that she had had. I think it was maybe a friend of hers or their son or something. And I was describing how I remembered only just this brief kind of moment in time. Um, and it was a mantis being in these two little grays and I couldn't get this image out of my head. So I was drawing it out and the mantis being was wearing this particular 
like a, I guess a robe would be the best description of it. And um, there, it was like a burgundy with gold um, kind of striping. It was like a V-neck. And I was, as I was drawing it, I, uh, especially that gold part, I heard, no, not like that. And mm. in my head. And so it was kind of like, <laughs> and I was brand new to all of this. I didn't know anything about any of it. And, uh, and so I always found that really interesting. And I remember, I think I was just chatting one time with Denise and, and I was telling her about this story and she was just like, wait a second, tell me what that robe looked like. And so I told her and she said, I know someone who had an interaction with a mantis and described a robe just like that, which I thought mm -hmm. was really fascinating because I haven't heard it too much uh -huh. since then too, but yeah. she's awesome. And Denise. <laughs> Denise has interacted with mantis beings and the greys. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, Okay. So I'm keeping you all to myself. Um, <laughs> Angels wants to know um, if you've heard the title or the name of the taller grays be termed as controllers. Controllers. Hmm. Um, are we talking about those that are over five and a half feet tall? I those think so. Yeah. The tall, we were talking about the, the tall grays versus the little short ones. Yeah. I, you know, there are lots of names. I mm -hmm. vaguely vaguely some people like to uh put uh name them by their behavior <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah the controllers yes well, that would make sense. Charge. yep that's true uh larry wants to know why you think they wipe our memories well they have said to me that they work as quietly as they can because mm. they realize that if we remembered all of this, that it could have a profound impact on us and on our society as well, because they're so different than mm -hmm. us. You know, they speak telepathically. They look different uh, from us. The way they communicate is just phew, really, really intense. And, uh, you know, so, and their tech technology is yeah. so far in advance of our own that uh, it would be uh, extraordinarily difficult for us to have them uh, living among us. <laughs> so yeah. to speak, you know, they. Uh, I I know that at least some of them are fifth dimensionals, mm -hmm. and because I can feel their presence when they come to visit. Mm -hmm. through that tingling sensation and I can receive downloads of information from mm -hmm. them and feel kind of spaced out yeah. when they're yeah. occurring. But, uh, you know, but they're not, uh, they're not bad. Yeah. Anymore. I used to think they were because I was so frightened. But yeah. I, I've changed my mind. Yeah. At least the ones, I'm not saying that they're all, not <laughs> all of them, right. some of them are. You right. Know, some are, are malevolent and mm -hmm. they're, most of them are somewhere in between. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, you know, and it's like I think it's just like any any species, you know, there are some really great humans. There are some really terrible humans, but most of us are kind of in between. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Carol wants to know why you think some people are contacted and others aren't. You know, that's a good question. And that's what I also asked. And uh, they said that initially uh, it was opportunistic. They mm -hmm. just uh, took people who maybe were driving down the road or out fishing or hiking or camping, that sort of thing. And when they had the characteristics that they were looking for, mm -hmm. then uh, they wanted to study them along family lines in order to upgrade the human genome and to also uh, upgrade uh, consciousness, spirituality, uh, psychic, your psychic ability, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I've heard, I have heard some people talk about how they've interacted and they've found that um, they were searching out people who had more heightened psychic abilities, maybe, or were more in touch with psychic abilities. Um, and that was one of the markers, I guess, they were looking for. But it's really interesting. Um, let's see. There was another one. Let me, uh, 
Let it go. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Okay, so Don wants to know what was the mo your most positive case you've worked on, Kathleen? The most positive case I've ever worked on. Um, in terms of abduction cases, mm -hmm. I, there's a man uh, who lived in Canada. Uh, he let me use his name, Jim, Jim Schaefer, mm -hmm. and he was in Winnipeg. And he uh, started having experiences, and I investigated his case. And um, what was so positive about it was that he developed lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And he was extraordinarily uh, frightened that he was going to die from this cancer. Yeah. Um, and so I said to him, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who have asked for healing and received it from their ETs. So I said, start sending telepathic messages to them all times of day and night, because I know they can sometimes hear what you're, what you're thinking or saying. Mm -hmm. And so he did, and he kept a camera in his room. And a couple of weeks later, I received a call from him, and he said, I have to send you this video. He said, last night an orb came into my bedroom, crossed the room, dove down into my body. I immediately fell asleep. But when I, when I woke up, this was the morning after, when he woke up, the nodes on his neck were no longer visible. Wow. And uh, so he actually did capture that, that video wow. on camera. And I have it on my computer. I show it when I do presentations. And, uh, and he was healed. He went in, he did have the surgery. He didn't dare to say I was healed by uh, extraterrestrials. Right, <laughs> smart man, yep. <laughs> and so he did have the surgery, but they removed four very tiny necrotic nodes. They were not cancerous at that point. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. There was also a, another great experience uh, and this was two women, and uh, I had met them through my colleague Stanton Friedman, with whom I wrote three books, and they were highly regarded paranormal investigators, and they uh, wanted to for me to connect them with a verified experiencer uh, and to see if they could set up a lot of equipment mm -hmm. at his home and he could try to call in a craft and they could record it. Mm -hmm. So I did. Uh, in fact, Chris Bledsoe, you probably mm -hmm. have heard of Chris Bledsoe. Uh, yep, yeah, once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, he, he speaks with highly benevolent mm -hmm. uh, ETs or uh, ladies in, in, in white mm -hmm. who give prophecy, like Marian prophecies. Wow. And so the, the two women were there. They set up their equipment. Um, they had a Bell and Howell movie camera going. Mm -hmm. They had um, their ghost boxes and um, recorders in their hands. Chris is uh, looking for a craft to come in, and he sees one next to the moon. And he mm -hmm. says, oh, I think that's one. And so they start asking questions to these, these craft mm -hmm. and they start receiving um, these uh, electronic voice phenomena mm. uh, kind of things on, on their equipment. And it's, it's grown a little larger. And then they're standing up, they're holding onto each other and reeling back and forth. They don't know what has happened. The equipment they had in their hands is no longer there. They finally find it under a bush <laughs> nearby. And so they pick it all up and they, they get the movie camera. They go into Chris's house and his wife says, where have you been? I've been looking for you. Do you realize what time it is? Well, they thought, oh, probably 11 o'clock. 
one o'clock. Oh, wow. It was one o'clock. And so uh, the women ended up uh, kind of having a falling out over this. Oh, wow. And yeah, that was unfortunate. So yeah. I was able to uh, investigate the case. I, I never did get up to Chris's because of COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh, I yeah. There. yeah. I've talked to him. I've interviewed him, too, because mm -hmm. he was taken to craft. Mm -hmm. And um, so I hypnotized one of the women mm -hmm. uh, one year, and uh, it's amazing under hypnosis, she talked about these human, uh, two men and two women uh, who were dressed in the men in blue and the women in kind of a beautiful iridescent white, mm. um, long kind of flowing brown, light brown hair and uh, larger eyes than human, uh, thinner lips. But they're pretty much human in, in most ways, except for they had telepathic communication. Mm -hmm. And um, they showed her many, many things. They told her that uh, they had once lived on this planet and there was an environmental collapse, but they had the technology uh, to move on and that they had moved on and they had found uh, another planet in a binary star system and uh, they this planet was in twilight most of the time and you know they lived there for a while they their technology to develop uh, in parts replacement and genetic engineering all of those things so that they can live for about 800 years wow. and they just travel through space now they said they that they hop through time and space mm -hmm. and they don't take anything from this planet they just come back to check up on us from mm -hmm. time to time and they told Pam that uh, they had known her through all lifetimes oh wow yeah that's that was pretty interesting yeah uh, to me and and uh Ashley was the other one. They, they've permitted me to use their names. I have signed releases from them. And uh, she, uh, there were more the mantis types. Mm -hmm. um, so she went into an area with them and absolutely loved them. She wasn't mm -hmm. the least bit fearful. They were so kind yeah. to her. And she and Pam were put into onto these beds, and it was like a tanning bed that came up over their bodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were given uh, the information that they were going to be traveling. And uh, human bodies are too dense to mm -hmm. do this travel; that we would they would be uh, harmed. And so they were inside these. Uh, sort of, like I said, tanning beds, mm -hmm. and they became unconscious. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they arrived at sort of what they called a way station that they thought might have been the moon. Mm -hmm. And they saw uh, buildings there that were not like our buildings. They were um, taken out of the craft into like a, a large building that you could see through that, that had connectors in different types of colors. It was domed. Mm -hmm. and there were many, many entities in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for Ashley, it was just like a family reunion. She just loved mm -hmm. uh, being there as well. And, and what was so interesting to me about this case is for a few seconds on that video camera, they captured the abduction in progress. Wow. And I have done a frame by frame analysis on it. So when I speak uh, this year at different places, I will be showing that yeah. um, as long as I'm not speaking about Betty and Barney, I can't do both <laughs> at once. But, um, yeah. So it, what it shows is like an indigo beam of light mm -hmm. that comes out. You can see uh, one that looks like uh, 
a fairy. I call her Tinkerbell. Oh, wow. <laughs> she's holding a little wand in her hand and mm -hmm. she's dropping off this beam and materializing mm -hmm. uh, more solid as she comes off it and larger too. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one who was sitting cross-legged on the ground who was wearing something on his back. And suddenly he rose up and you could see that he was seated on a chair mm -hmm. and there was something that curved underneath for his to go on. Mm -hmm. And he had a blue light in one hand and a white light in the other. And as he glided along, he just moved those lights back and forth as he looked back and forth. He was probably looking for Pam and Ashley and Chris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, it is absolutely amazing. And then um, there was a flash of light and you could see one fairly close up to the camera. And there was another one which was clearly uh, a mantis type sitting in the tree. Wow. And you could see you could see its hands. Okay, here we go. Those like, yeah. you know, mitten type hands. Yeah. Those large hands and that face that comes down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amazing. This is all on the video? It's on the video. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. You really you have to slow the video way down. I yeah. just that's why I did I found all these things by doing a frame by frame analysis. Wow. Of the video. That's incredible though. Wow. Yeah. It oh. is. It's excellent evidence. Yeah. That's insane. I think yeah. Wow. <laughs> That is crazy. It's blowing my mind. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, we'll do one more question before we go to break. Um, and then I do want to keep talking about experiencers, but I also want to talk about, um, I think I heard you talk about this in Exeter or several years back, about the powdery substance on Betty's dress and the... Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but let me ask this question first, and then we'll go to break after this one. Uh, what are your thoughts of the science community disregarding experiencers while researching UAP because experiencers only provide anecdotal information? Well, it's uh, ridiculous to say that experiencers provide only anecdotal information, uh, as you just heard. <laughs> and uh, people in the science community are just uh, so many of them entrenched in the zeitgeist of the old guard. Mm -hmm. They're afraid uh, if, if they do anything new, if they don't follow their peers, that they will be ostracized. And so many of them just don't either have the time or the interest to look into it, even those who are vocal, uh, anti-UFO, anti-contact, people, but I'm very pleased with the new scientific team and the, the government's agency that has been formed. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read uh, Skidwalkers at the Pentagon. Mm. If you read that book, that it has been cleared by the Department of Defense. Oh. And the person who ran the first program is a swap, something like that, um, at the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, had a tremendous amount of information about that. You know, it, there's a highly negative consciousness there, unfortunately. And then they don't know how to deal with it, I don't think. I'm, I wish I could talk to them and help them, yeah. um, knowing what to do. And all it is is learning Mm -hmm. to just be loving yeah. and to project love because negativity hates love. Mm -hmm. They, they'll feed on people. They call them hitchhikers. They've gone home with all of the uh, scientists who have been there, military mm -hmm. people. And um, they show up as uh, dark shadow figures over mm -hmm. their beds uh, and nobody's accusing them of having sleep paralysis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are orbs <laughs> flying around this poltergeist activity. That's uh, crazy. Pretty interesting. And, and this book has been approved by the Department of Defense, you said? Yes, yeah. Wow. It's recently released. Um, 
and uh, it's yeah, it's a really good book. I'm on my second read of it. And wow, fascinating. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get that. That sounds mm -hmm. intriguing. Um, okay, so let's take our break really quick. So we'll take a five minute break, everyone, and then we'll be right back. And we'll uh, let's talk about Betty's dress, and then we'll go back to. Um, I know we're gonna have a lot more experience or questions, and I'd love to talk to you more, kind of about the intergenerational research that you've done as well, because um, I think that there's a lot to that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back to our number two of Spaced Out Saturday. I'm your host, Lynn Wallington, and thank you for being with us tonight. Don't forget that if you've missed portions of the show or others, you can check out our archives at youtube.com slash spaced out radio. Just do us the favor and hit that subscribe button while you're there. And thank you all for your generous super chats tonight. It's a really great, great way to support SOR on a nightly basis, and we definitely appreciate it. Our website is spaceoutradio.com where we have a ton of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot. And don't forget to read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Also, if you know anyone who would love the show tonight and who wouldn't, go ahead and share it with them right now so they can join in on the fun with us. And if you're enjoying this episode and haven't done it yet, please consider subscribing to our channel. We love adding new members to our Spaced Out Radio family. And if you want to join us for our big part Las Vegas party on April 22nd through the 24th, and why wouldn't you want to join us? It's going to be a great time. Don't forget to RSVP to info at spacedoutradio.com. Uh, it's, like I said, it's going to be a great time, and we would definitely love to see you there. Okay, let's get back to the show. Let me get Kathleen back. Welcome back, Kathleen. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so before we go um, and talk more about experiencers, so I remember, as I was saying, I think it was in Exeter, hearing you talk about Betty's dress, and mm -hmm. the, there was like a powdery substance that was found on it. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that for those who haven't heard? Yes. Uh, when Betty arrived home, she uh, took her dress and put it into her closet. Mm -hmm. And the next time she took it out, it was covered with a pink powdery substance. She was going to throw it away, but she decided not to. And uh, so that dress has been analyzed in more laboratories probably than I can count. And uh, the not just for the pink powder, but for other stains that are on the dress. Mm -hmm. The pink powder is anomalous because there's no uh, logical explanation for how that could have gotten there. Mm -hmm. um, except for by uh, Betty's account, where the entities held her around her, her shoulders, you know, with their wrapped their long fingers around. Mm -hmm. And that's where her dress is so saturated with that pink. Right. And then um, at the back of the zipper, where the uh, ET tried to unzip her dress, but didn't know how to undo a zipper and broke the zipper, tore the fabric of the zipper. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, you know, so a lot of pink back there. No, no pink around the waistline. Mm -hmm. But when her, uh, she helped him to take her dress off and it dropped to the floor. Now the hem, that part of the dress that hit the floor is covered with mm -hmm. that pink powdery substance as well. Uh, so the the best explanation that I have found in science, there are two, two great scientists who have worked on that. Mm -hmm. And one of them believes that it is some kind of a fungus mm -hmm. that grew there and uh, then, then died and became the powder. Uh, the other one believes that it might be a yeast. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can have either a pink fungus or a pink yeast. And this one is a, has a PhD in plant uh, biology. And he, his theory is that Betty's dress was uh, put under a sterilization process and that it killed all of the bacteria and viruses that might've been on that dress. And so it created the, the perfect environment for yeast to grow in. And so it grew flourished and, and then died. Recently, when I was up at the University of New Hampshire uh, to do a television show with Bed Hansen, uh, we were looking at the lining of the dress. And I'm, I know this is shown on television now, so I can tell you about it, that uh, on the inside lining on the front, near where Betty's navel would be, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a series of stains and Betty always said that they had inserted a na needle into her navel mm -hmm. and uh, so there was a DNA test done and that is 
uh, fluid from Betty's body. Now the outside of the dress does not, it didn't saturate through to the exterior of the dress. It's just on the inside in the location of her navel. So I think that that's really uh, very good evidence. And then I can't tell you because I've, I've just published an update on mm -hmm. my book, Captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, the 60th anniversary update. Thanks. And scientists found uh, some uh, substances on Betty's dress that should not have been, hmm. should not have been there. And that's, it's highly significant. Interesting. Well, we'll just have to get the book to find out, I guess. That sounds interesting. That's intriguing. Well, I definitely want to know. <laughs> that's, that's good on people who have curious minds like me. <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk, get back to experiencers, because I know that is a big part of your work as well as working with experiencers. Mm -hmm. um, when did you kind of go from or what, or maybe it was just a natural transition, but investigating Betty and Barney's case to then working with experiencers and, and wanting to, you know, start a support group and run your own support group for them and, and all of that. Well, Betty had a lot of friends who were experiencers. So uh, I knew them because we had a close relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, this was back, I moved back to New Hampshire um, from Colorado, in 1983 and so in that time frame um i started meeting them and talking to them and um, that sort of thing and i guess it was just a natural outgrowth that i would talk about betty and what happened to her and barney and then people would just come to me because they felt they could trust me because it was something in my own family and some new could just sense that I was an experiencer. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how I started talking with them. And then they were flocking to me so many that I, I just couldn't handle it. Mm. And so I, uh, I was then the Mutual UFO Networks Director of uh, Experiencer Research. I guess they were calling it abduction research in the beginning. And my team just kept growing and growing and growing. And it was just uh, a team of kind, caring uh, people who listened non-judgmentally mm -hmm. just to help people. And that really does help a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, MUFON has decided not to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I don't know where we're going next. Yeah. But um, it, it just grew and grew and grew. Uh, at the end, we had 50 people who were just listening and, mm -hmm. and learning at the same time. They, it was a tremendous learning experience mm -hmm. and helping uh, compassionate people. And we had, I think it was six uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and uh, two. Now I'm a research associate. Mm -hmm. And we had another research associate. That's amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, in terms of a support group. Yes. I was uh, doing support groups at uh, conferences, mm -hmm. large conferences. I would run support groups. Also, I was always Denise's assistant when she ran her support groups near Orlando. Yeah. And uh, so I was just doing a lot of support. And uh, about a year ago, I was meditating with a group and just thinking, what do we give us some guidance on what to do next? And the guidance we, I received was, uh, you need to start a support group and you need to call it Awakening Souls. Yeah. And so the next morning, I set up the website and uh, people started to come. And Awakening Souls is for people who are pretty much longtime experiencers who, mm -hmm. some of them are young, but mm -hmm. they worked through the fear. Yeah. And they're, uh, they feel 
a need to reach out to others uh, in compassion. And uh, it, it's really a great group. I, I enjoy it immensely. We meet once a month uh, uh, via Zoom. So it's people, uh, we have one member from the Philippines. Wow. Yes. It's yeah. incredible. Uh-huh. That's amazing. So these are experiencers who are also working with experiencers as well? Well, not all of them are, mm -hmm. but they feel like they need to reach out to others. So not everyone in the group has sort of evolved mm -hmm. as much as some of the older people in yeah. the group. So the older ones are helping the younger ones too. And, you know, it's it's just so wonderful because someone will talk about their experience. We're doing presentations now, PowerPoints for oh, one nice. another, uh, one month. And uh, people are learning from each other. The younger ones will say, oh, I had that happen too. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that anyone else had ever had that. You know, so it's just that kind of confirmation that that feels really good. Yeah, and it's so important too. It, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so let's talk again about the the intergenerational research. So that to me is is really intriguing, and it feels like there's so much more we have to learn about that. And I could be wrong, but it seems like it's an interesting phenomenon. And I'm always curious: do are most people intergenerational experiencers or, or come from intergenerational families of experiencers? Or is it kind of a one-off? Like maybe one person in this family will have something, um, but the rest of them won't. Not everyone in the same family will necessarily mm -hmm. uh, be an experiencer. I don't know what determines that. Yeah. Um, but you might have, uh, a family of five and, and three of the five are taken. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Now, I've worked on three uh, studies on experiencers that amount to about 5,000, I guess. I, my mm -hmm. first study was small. It was with Denise. Uh, second one, Freeze, of course. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, a study of 516 people that we did through MUFON's experiencer research team and Dr. Don C. Don Derry, psychologist, uh, professor from McGill University, research psychologist, worked on that study. And Dr. Michael Austin Melton, whom you might know. Mm -hmm. Yes. And okay. uh, Craig Lang, who uh, is no longer with us, unfortunately, mm -hmm. he passed. And uh, Denise worked on that as well. So uh, we have gathered quite a lot of good information on the commonalities that experiencers share. Now, in our study, um, the, the greatest uh, percentage of experiencers had contact with the grays in general. Um, either we, we didn't separate it into tall grays, small mm -hmm. grays, that sort of thing. But with the grays... And uh, those, uh, those are, well, it's not just grays who do um, intergenerational contact, but uh, we had uh, a great deal of uh, contact with the group that Dr. Don Derry identified as those who had UFO abduction syndrome through a test. And all that means, I know that sounds terrible, but it, uh, they developed it when Bud Hopkins was alive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's based on the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory. Mm -hmm. And so it this test identifies uh, the experiencers who... Uh, have had uh, have memories of being on the craft. They know what it's like, and also have certain emotional markers of uh, like trauma, for example. Because you always carry a little bit of that, I think, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we found that the abductee group mm -hmm. uh, scored higher on everything than the experiencers in general. Mm. Um, higher spirituality, higher 95% um, empaths, 
uh, a very high percentage of psychics, mm. um, very high percentage of intergenerational contact. Interesting. Mm. Now, why? Okay, so um, I apologize if you had said this. So, did they themselves differentiate whether they felt they were an experiencer or an abductee? It was the test. That, oh, okay. I'm sorry, maybe I didn't. Maybe I left that out. <laughs> Dr. Don Derry administered the American Personality Inventory. That okay. was the test I was talking about that Bud, Bud Hopkins and and okay. he and um, a psychiatric social worker from Long okay. Island uh, worked on and developed um, to. And there were three categories. Either you could end up being uh, and having UFO abduction syndrome, mm -hmm. or you could be a wannabe and know a lot about the topic, but you didn't have the other characteristics they yeah. were looking for. And then there were just members of the general public who might have jumped in to take that just to throw off our results. Oh, okay. um, so he was able to identify uh, what group those people belong to. And on our test, we also put in a couple of trick questions mm. to identify hoaxers too and we eliminated them yeah. but, uh, so he was able to identify those with ufo abduction syndrome which which i i have too yeah <laughs> yeah i wanted to try out the test and so he said okay and and he tested me and there i was pretty close mm. to the center of the bullseye oh i bet <laughs> <laughs> um Oh, so this is interesting. I don't know if this would have anything to do with it. Um, but Sensei versus what about intergenerational assassinations like the Kennedy family? Um, Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would like it if we had assassinations among experiencers. No, <laughs> let's hope not. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, so did you find, so did you find that there was any, any people who, now I know you'd said like not everyone in the family would be um, experiencers, but have you ever like worked with anyone who was the only person in their family who was an experiencer? Who? God, that, no one's ever asked me that question. I think I, I have, yeah, I believe so. There, uh, I worked on a case uh, of, uh, he was a commercial pilot mm -hmm. and he had retired and opened a business at a small airport that he had. And he lived on the property. And one night he went outside because he heard people outside and uh, he wanted to, you know, was it teenagers out there drinking to vandalize the place or what? But it was a group of people who were looking at a, a craft. Mm -hmm. And he said it was the most brilliant light that he had ever seen in his life. And so uh, this guy was uh, about 47, probably. Mm -hmm. And maybe a little older than that. And he became so fascinated by this that he decided he was going to try to call them in. And he ended up being successful in doing that, hmm. using lasers. And then he started being taken. Hmm. And uh, it, it ended up being a place that was like the Skinwalker Ranch that, you know, once you stimulate this portal, you're, um, stepping into their territory mm -hmm. and so he he ended up being taken he was he was terrified mm. um, it was it's really a sad story mm -hmm. but he didn't he didn't know what he was doing he thought right. he was going to sit down and have a conversation with these mm. entities and uh, find out what they were all about but um just as in the Skinwalker Ranch, there was a highly negative side of it where uh, he would he was sitting in his office with his shirt off mm -hmm. one time and there were just three scratches that raked down his oh. chest. And 
poor guy. Uh, it took, it, he said it was almost a month before it was completely healed. And these entities just came back and the craft came. He was able to cap capture a couple of pretty good photographs. He, he took pictures of the entities, but there was only one that was what I would think was halfway decent. Mm -hmm. And it looked like uh, it was an entity with a heart-shaped face, mm -hmm. a head that came yeah. down to a point, long neck. And it was in the process of materializing. It was green. Hmm. So it might have been uh, a mantis. I'm not sure. Yeah. Interesting. It's hard to tell. So did he ever, did he have a lot of conscious memories about his experience or experiences then afterwards? Um, no, he yeah. didn't have a lot, any conscious memory of what happened on the craft. None whatsoever, but he would, he would, uh, one time woke up two miles away from his house, barefoot in, in his underwear. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that kind, not of, great. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, he was so terrified of all of this that he started sleeping with his gun. Hmm. Wow. And, uh, he, there was one in his room and he shot it mm -hmm. and it disappeared and <laughs> flash of blue light interesting yeah um have you heard or have in your research has it shown that there is a lot of overlap because i get this question quite often um between the paranormal i.e you know spirits um orbs I, orbs kind of kind of go back and forth between both um scenarios it seems but have you noticed if there's a lot of overlap between the paranormal and experiencers? Sometimes. Hmm. Sometimes that happens. Um, the on We ask those questions and 61% of the experiencers had observed conscious orbs in their homes. Hmm. They, they appeared to contain co consciousness. Okay. Um, also the sensation that something unseen was walking on the mattress, you could feel it. You could mm. feel those feet on the bed, but you couldn't see the entity. So it had it's weird. It had weight, but it wasn't visible. That is um, interesting. Not so much poltergeist activity. It depends upon the experiencer. And I sometimes wonder mm -hmm. for those people who have these negative things going on in their homes, if it's just that a, a portal has mm -hmm. been left open yeah. and uh you know those the ets are generally fifth and sixth dimensionals mm -hmm. and so um, they're using that interdimensional portal if it's left open yeah other interdimensionals can come in too the mm -hmm. ones that can bother people right absolutely yeah that would make that would make them total sense. And if uh, that person is terrified, if there's a lot of fear and violence yes. from that person, that kind of attitude, mm -hmm. then that's going to feed the negative types. They love that. That that They dine off that. And they dine and they grow. Mm -hmm. So it creates problems who have that militaristic kind of attitude and the fear. And I just read in... Um, skinwalkers at the Pentagon, mm -hmm. that at the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, those scientists and military people who were working there actually had sort of fear imposed on them, mm -hmm. absolute terror when they felt that they would not have otherwise felt terror. So it seems like those negative entities just wanted someone to feed off them and they could lower the person's vibrational frequency and jump onto that person and attach to them. They took them home with them to their families, unfortunately. Ugh. And and friends and neighbors just spread. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm definitely gonna have to read that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm always curious as to how often people who um, are are having, you know, what they would call paranormal experiences, because a lot of the times, especially like you were talking about, um, you can't always see the ET around you. Sometimes you can just sense them around you. Um, and I wonder if 
you know, how does one tell the difference between are you sensing a spirit or are you sensing an ET? Is there a difference? Really? I don't know. Interesting. Oh, gosh. <laughs> don't you have the answers to this, Kathleen? Come on. <laughs> Versus an ET. I can only tell you. And I don't, I'm not even sure that that's what I was seeing. But after Stanton died, yeah. Now, Stanton and I, he told, called me before he died, a mm. few days before, and he said, I don't think I'm going to be living much longer. I really have a strong sense oh, wow. that I'm going to pass. And uh, we had always made a deal. And I reminded him of this. I said, well, if you go, come and visit me. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, cause he lived in New Brunswick. We had, ne Even though we wrote books together, we only saw each other when we worked at conferences. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, come visit me. And he said, well, it should be a lot easier without a body. <laughs> so <Aww. laughs> I was, uh, my husband and I were just getting ready for bed. I was in bed. He was still in, in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was two, the day after, I guess, mm -hmm. the night after Pant Stanton had passed. Yeah. And I suddenly felt this very strong electrical tingling in my body. Mm. And there in the corner of my room was a small lighted orb. Mm. And I said, is that you, Stan? And I heard him say, I'm sorry, Kathy. He, was, he always apologized. He apologized to me when he had a heart attack. <laughs> he oh. said, Sorry, because he wasn't around to work with me any longer. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed working with him too. Yeah, and um, so we communicated a little bit, and and then a couple of days later, he came mm -hmm. back again. I felt that tingling again, and uh, he said, uh, "I have to go now." That was the day of his funeral. Yeah. So I guess he then you know, went hmm. to the hereafter for the lessons he's learning. Wow. And, um, so there's the, if uh, I think that was Stanton, I don't think it was somebody impersonating him. It's yeah. Like him and this is his sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's sort of the same feeling as yeah. when, and the ET that I communicate with, comes into my office and I can feel yeah. that individual. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if that makes me wonder if, um, so, you know, we, after you you know someone and you've been around them, they, they kind of have their own sort of energy, right? That you rec it's recognizable that, you know, that, that person, you recognize their energy, um, which would make sense then why you would recognize that as Stanton since you guys were so close. Um, mm -hmm. And since, and the ET that comes to you quite often. I'm assuming it's the same one. I think up. it's the same one. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if we we sort of learn to read their energies in that in that sense. You know that we recognize that same sort of. Um, I don't know if energy is the right word, but it's the only thing I can think of to kind of describe uh, that uh, energetic fingerprint. Maybe <laughs> I don't know mm -hmm. the way to describe it, but you yeah, know what I'm trying to yeah. say. Like that's, each person has their own. Way. That's a good way to describe it. And I was just thinking there was a difference between yeah. Stanton's energy and the CTs. Yeah. Because when he comes in, I my mind goes blank. It's like there's something that comes over my head and uh, I can't think. I, yeah. I, I, if I try to think of something, I can't. It won't okay. enter my mind. Um, only what he's going to communicate can enter my mind, it seems. It's interesting. But I'm assuming at this point, there's probably not a lot of fear around. No this fear thing. at all. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, somebody had a question. Let me go back. Um, Cause I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. And maybe, you know, maybe Stanton can help out with this one when he has a chance. Uh, what do you think happens when we die, Kathleen? It'd be great if he could come back and help out with that one. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm I'm a quantum healing hypnosis practitioner. 
And so uh, I do past life regressions as well as working with experiencers. Sometimes experiencers were experiencers in past lives. Oh, wow. And sometimes they were ETs mm -hmm. who reincarnated into a human body this time or walked in to uh, assist in our development. Mm. So anyway, what generally happens when a person dies is they uh, go into an environment of just pure love. And I have to say, that's the kind of love that the ETs projected at me. I've never felt the intensity of that kind of love. Yeah. But um, then they, they'll float around for a while. And I don't do life lives between lives i want to mm -hmm. study that because that's the most fascinating thing yes. to me. but i've read a lot about it mm -hmm. and so generally um you meet your family first and you know your close friends that kind of thing they'll come and meet you but then you're only with them a short time and you're you go off with your soul group mm -hmm. and you go to a place of learning and so the, the lessons that you learned together, um, the, you can no longer keep secrets. Everything that you ever did in your life yeah. is open <laughs> <laughs> there. And so, um, you know, they, you, just, you learn from one another and, and review your lives. And then you go on for deeper learning and more learning. And until the time finally comes uh, when you are given the opportunity to come back if you'd like to. Mm -hmm. And so you come back uh, for to take care of karma from a past life, um, to you sort of pay debts so that you can elevate. It's a you know, it's a lot like Buddhism. You can mm -hmm. elevate at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. Some people will choose to come back with with her, horrible disabilities in order mm -hmm. to elevate at a higher rate oh, wow. as well. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, that is really fascinating. Um, let's see. Trippy Times podcast wants to know, does Kathleen believe NDE or, or trauma could possibly activate a person to have experiences or maybe begin seeing something that was always there, like a form of neuroplasticity? Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, to have a near death experience, uh, of course, activates many of the things that are activated in ET contact experiencers, the uh, becoming empathic, becoming psychic. Uh, a lot of mediums that I know uh, are experiencers of contact. And so it, that sort of all goes together. Now, there was a study that was done by, um, it was an academic study done at the University of Connecticut by um, two professors, Ring and, and Rosen. And it was on near-death experiencers and experiencers of contact. They did more than one study, actually. But what they determined is that both groups have a lot in common in terms of even electromagnetic interference in, in their homes, um, uh, some paranormal phenomena, and uh, what I just did, described, the psychic ability, the being empaths, mediums, that sort of thing. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there's and definitely... Experience. Experience. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, there's definitely... I don't know if it's just kind of crossing into a different dimension because, uh, well, I guess trauma doesn't necessarily, you're not necessarily crossing into a different dimension, but NDE and experiencers, certainly there is that ability to cross kind of dimensions, let's say. And, you know, that may open us up to more than what we had either noticed or perceived before. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, the, sort of theorized that when we are taken into a portal 
which puts us into a different dimensional state. As our molecules activate, as they become energized, we come apart. And when this happens, I'm wondering if our consciousness or our soul on that thin thread is just like having a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I yeah. talked to some academic scientists about that, and they thought that I might be on to something. Mm -hmm. uh, also, a fairly high percentage of experiencers who took part in our studies had, had near-death experiences as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know which came first. Yeah, that would be interesting. We didn't ask. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be your next study. <laughs> if I ever do another one. But yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. Fascinating. Um, let's see. Cat Chaser wants to know how you feel about rem remote viewing. Oh, I think that it's fantastic that mm. people are able to do that, and uh, I'm I'm fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know several remote viewers, and and uh, they they are, are very good for <laughs> government people who are want spying. Yeah, <laughs> be done, you know it, that sort of thing. So yes, mm. it's real. Yes, people learn to do it. Remote viewer. Hmm? Speaking no. of remote viewers, I heard something. Was it Yuri Geller that predicted that the ETs were, there was an invasion coming or something crazy? I just read this recently. I can't remember now, but I don't know if you had heard that or not. I haven't heard that yet. Interesting. <laughs> uh, well, let's hope he's wrong. <laughs> right. Let's hope he's wrong. <laughs> yeah. He can't be right 100% of the time. So we're going to go with he's wrong. <laughs> um. So speaking of kind of predictions, that's another phenomenon that seems to happen quite often with experiencers is you hear oftentimes it, not necessarily predictions, but maybe warnings. Um, and I remember when I first started working with experiencers about 10 years ago, that was something I heard quite often, but I don't hear it quite as much anymore. Have you had that same experience? Well, some experiencers will warn about coming volcanoes or mm. floods and and they're accurate about yeah. that but most no it's 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 not that common I, yeah. as far as i know if if it is they're not telling me yeah yeah it used to be something i would hear uh, quite often and it was more uh doomsday kind of scenarios you know of our own destruction of our own creation um but i don't really hear that too much anymore which is that's good. It's either good or bad. One or the other. <laughs> it's either just past the point of no return or it's not happening. So yeah. we'll go with a that. Lot of, a lot of experiencers feel that something mm. is going to happen. They've been talking about it for a very long time and that they have a, a job to do when that mm. happens. And they don't know what it is and they don't know what that job is. Yes. But uh, a lot of are beginning to feel feel that it might be the reveal that mm. uh, the ETs will end up showing themselves and everyone will know that they're here. I hope so. That would be amazing. So what do you think? Do you think that's, that's going to happen? Or do you think that, because I really just don't see our government giving full disclosure unless they absolutely have to, they're, they, they're kind of given no choice. Do you think personally, based on either your own experiences or your work with experiencers, that the ET are going to step in and do it? Well, what the ETs say, mm -hmm. um, the ones that I've spoken with, yeah. is that uh, they don't, as I said earlier, they really don't want to interfere, mm -hmm. uh, but they want the reveal. They want us on our planet and they've yeah. been trying to do this since 1954. Wow. They they want us uh, to acknowledge their presence. They're here, they say, to assist in our development. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a primitive species. They're very concerned that uh, our behavior will lead to uh, an a environmental collapse due to nuclear war or mm -hmm. 
simply because uh, greed prevails yeah. uh, on this planet and those people who have the power uh, don't really care about the environment, mm -hmm. many of them, and, and you can see what it's leading to. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. They, they told me that they would only um, interfere mm -hmm. or come in if we were going to have a nuclear war or it was, you know, getting pretty close to the end of time. And yeah. They don't want it to happen again. They've said it's happened once wow. on this planet. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny that, you know, I told you about Pam and Ashley. Yeah. I was going to ask you about and that. Pam, was, Pam, did, Pam didn't know this information mm -hmm. that I'd been given, but her ETs told her that as oh, well. Wow. Or should I say, er, ex Earthlings? <laughs> ex Earthlings, yes, I love it. Um, so that was you said. So they they were the ones who experienced the kind of nuclear fallout uh, and and left the planet. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, oh, here's whatever here's it was. I don't know yeah. if it was a nuclear war or what it was, but they left some the sort planet. of destruction. Yes. Um, where did this one go? Oh, here we go. Uh, this is one people are always curious about. Does Kathleen think that RH negative blood type is of possible ET origin? I don't know if it's of ET origin. Mm -hmm. It was uh, something that we studied. And what we discovered was uh, that 15 to 16% of the general population has RH negative blood. Among the experiencers who were in our study, it was 31%. And among the abductee group, it was 33%. Hmm. So a little bit higher. Both are significantly high. Yeah. Um, but still, RH positive blood mm -hmm. is most prevalent. Yeah. But the, the Basque population... In, in Spain uh, was primarily RH negative. Hmm. So a uh, large percentage of that population. Uh, did they start there? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So <laughs> that the, 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 on that. the population of just Spain in general or the experiencers within Spain? Uh, the Basque population. Oh, okay. In Spain. Yeah. And, yes. Um, as I was doing my research, I discovered that there was a very high percentage of RH negative people who live hmm. there. That is interesting. Hmm. hmm. So, so what do you think is next as far as um, experiencers go? It seems like, um, and again, I don't know if this is something that you've noticed as well, but you know, it, there used to be a lot of physical interaction. And now it seems like a lot of it is more, um, let's just say astral, for lack of a better term, or psychic interactions, um, or communications. One, have you noticed that as well with experiencers? And two, do you have any thoughts about why that might be? Well, they had to take us to craft when they had physical procedures mm. to accomplish. Yeah. Um, now they uh, don't do that as often. It, it's it's hard. It's on the human body yeah. to go back and forth uh, from one environment to the next. And so they try to avoid that if they can. Mm. Um, and as we're growing older, um, they don't need to do what they used to do before. And so... Uh, they're more likely to come into our environment where, you know, we're, we're more comfortable with them now too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just being abducted um, scares the living daylights out of people. Yeah. If, if they can introduce themselves and, and come into your environment and uh, make you feel really great. Um, just filled with love mm -hmm. or, um, having a, just wonderful body sensations, then you're, you know, it's a lot better for people. Mm, yes, absolutely. 
And sometimes we go out of body. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that as well, which is mm -hmm. really interesting. Um, do you think that the people that are having these more psychic or out of body experiencers are um, ones that used to have physical experiences or is it a, a newer generation, a younger generation maybe that are kind of ushering in? Because it almost seems like people are more, not necessarily aware because I think people have always been aware of psychic phenomenon, but um, there's more acceptance. There's more interest in it. There's more, um, people kind of coming into their own abilities because I think, you know, we're all capable of these things. Um, while some may be more adept at it than others, we're all have, you know, we all have some psychic capabilities. Um, that's just my personal opinion. But do you think that this kind of awakening of the community psychic consciousness, I don't know how to describe it, uh, is leading to this more psychic um, visitation? It could be, I'm not certain, but yeah. as we increase our uh, consciousness, our understanding of consciousness and our level of spirituality, yeah. we are able to access more. We're yeah. able to see more because we're elevating to a higher dimension. And uh, so that would open us up to seeing things that we hadn't previously been able to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because I have people, even people that aren't necessarily in, you know, kind of the UFO or experiencer communities, um, talking about, you know, recently having such vivid dreams that they're, you know, amazed by it. And, mm -hmm. and I'm always curious, like, because it, it sort of overlaps kind of the conversation of UAPs and UFOs becoming more or less stigmatized that mm -hmm. now, and I don't think they've made that connection per se, but I've certainly noticed it and I don't know if it's connected, but have you seen this at all in your kind of dealings with the, you know, the average person seems like that you, when you would tell them I work with experiencers or in the UFO community, they used to be like, Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, and now they're like, that is interesting. Tell me more. Yes, yes. More and more people are becoming aware, which, you know, is a very good thing. Yeah. As long as uh they they're not believing this information that's coming from fear mongers. Yeah. Um, that uh, that we're all gonna be eaten. Or <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. They're all demons. Yes. Oh, yes. Fight against them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what can we do? What is our part in all of this with the the society in general that is really starting to em embrace this in a way that they haven't before? What role should we play? Well, uh, we all have different roles to play. Mm -hmm. And many of us have been given those roles, we've been told what they are. But it's uh, individuals, you, you can talk to your neighbors, yeah. you can talk to your friends. Um, and when you're doing that, talk about elevating consciousness, yeah. about raising the vibrational frequency, if you can explain it in a way that they will understand, uh, because it's going to make our planet a lot easier to live on. We have to get rid of the negativity. And there's so much negativity in the collective consciousness on this planet. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just not a good thing. It, mm. it leads to, it makes living here difficult. Mm. And if we can evolve to a level where we have more love, more spirituality, uh, higher vibrational frequency, then it will just be a lot more pleasant for all of us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right. So we're almost out of time. Let me see if I can get one or two more questions in for everyone. Uh, Nicole says, I read that there was a high probability of false memories with hypnotic regression. What are your thoughts? It depends upon who's doing the hypnosis, mm -hmm. and it depends upon what the individual knows. Now, you can use tricks as a, a hypnotherapist where 
you can uh, tell somebody if they're tempted to say something that's a lie or <laughs> um, make something up that they'll just become so confused that they can't say it. Or you can ex tell people, give the suggestion that they're going to tell the truth mm -hmm. and what they recall and not fill in information, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. Um, a hypnotherapist who uh, wants to give an individual an abduction when they didn't have one can uh, can make if that person really wants to have it, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of respect for that hypnotist who is some some kind of authority figure. Yeah, they can um, maybe remember things that they that didn't really happen, especially if you're talking about detailed memories. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, hypnotic memory is a lot like human memory in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just have access to a part of it, the, the subconscious mind that you didn't have in, in your normal everyday state, even though we're in hypnosis at mm -hmm. least a couple of times every day and sometimes more. Yes. So if you have your fireplace going. Oh, yes. You're driving long distances. That's that's all light hypnosis. Yes. So um, I just, I use forensic hypnosis. Hmm. When I work with people, it was a, a hypnosis that was developed by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, so that specifically, you would not lead someone. Yeah. And... Uh, in doing that, there's the the least possibility of uh, fabrication of yeah. information um, and confabulation. But I mean, if I I work with people, they they'll say to me, on, in, in hypnosis, this is what I see, but I can't believe this is what really happens. Something mm -hmm. like that, and um, you know, I can't determine. <laughs> Yeah, something that really happened or not. They just have to to look at it and make that assessment for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, if they know, particularly if they know a lot about the topic. Yeah. Yes, that is true. So it's it's pretty complex, I think. Hypnosis yeah. is. But, you know, as long as uh, you have to wonder what or consider what reason the person came for it. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, do they want true memories? Do they are they more interested in the therapeutic part of it, mm -hmm. or um, are they looking for both of these things? Because we can do both of them. Uh, in fact, uh, I use all kinds of things to um, comfort people mm -hmm. so that they will be able to have a very good experience. Um, yeah. And, and not relive mm. uh, the terror, particularly at the beginning. Yes. <laughs> that yeah. sort of thing. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Oh, um, my goodness, that I, I know. <laughs> Do you want to tell everyone um, your website again and where they can get, get your books? And maybe uh, if you have a conference coming up and people yes, um, see um, Kathleen, website. she's amazing in person. <laughs> My website is kathleen-marden.com, M-A-R-D-E-N. And uh, my books, autograph copies of my books are available on my website. Also, the conferences well, where I'll be speaking and uh, free articles that you can read. And then um, also they're available. You can order them at any bookstore. They're available at Amazon in all formats and also uh, Barnes and Noble. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen. It's been such a pleasure catching up with you. Thank you. And I have a new book coming out soon. So. Oh, yay. Yay. So when do you know when? Should we keep an eye um, out for that? I'm hoping that it's within the next month or two. Oh, that's exciting. So yeah. very soon. Uh -huh. All right. Well, we will keep an eye out for that. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen. You have a wonderful night. Nice talking with you. You, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
All right, everyone. Thank you so much for your great questions, as always. We had Mr. John bumblefoot Doll rocking us into the night with Women Rule the World, and we've got Mr. Dave Farley rocking us out with Ripple Effect. And because I love to chat with you, leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you found most interesting. A special thanks to everyone listening in at home, in your cars, with your coven, or wherever you may be. Thanks to everyone participating in our chat rooms on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch at Spaced Out Radio. Remember, the show is copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thanks for sharing your evening with us. And make sure you go on to After Hours. It's starting already, so just go refresh your screen and you should be able to find it. Even though we're leaving the couch for tonight, don't forget there's always a seat for you here tomorrow. Good night and go make some mischief, my friend. Oh, no.